Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Sarah Pache, Education and Outreach Specialist in New Mexico EBSCOR, and your MC for this afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the final event of the 2021 New Mexico Research Symposium. We have a very exciting program for you all this afternoon. At three o'clock, we're going to get started with our flash talks and present our exceptional student awards. Then at 3.30, we will then move on to present the outstanding New Mexico Science Teacher Awards. We will conclude our program um, when we announce our uh, poster competition winners at four o'clock this afternoon. All right. So before we get started, what is a flash talk? A flash talk or a three minute thesis is a presentation where researchers present their concept or ideas in three minutes with one slide in a manner that is understandable to a general audience. This afternoon, we will have seven smart grid researchers who will convey their research to you in this manner. For timekeeping purposes, Brittany will be keeping track of time, so just keep an ear out for her. All right, our first presenter this afternoon is going to be Jesse Krasmarkowski. And Jesse, go for it in three, two, one. How many times have you sat at home during a stormy night and the power flickers, causing your favorite show to buffer while you Wi-Fi resets? Does the thought of rolling blackouts uh, during extreme heat days make you nervous? Grid modernization in a nutshell refers to grid improvements that may decrease the frequency and magnitude of power outages. Consider a community microgrid installation. Built and maintained by your electric provider, these installations can serve your home and surrounding critical infrastructure directly or indirectly. The concept of a microgrid may be abstract from a technical perspective, but the impact they have is very real, localized, and personal. As an economist, I get excited about infrastructure that may improve the quality of people's lives, but I, have to, I also have the dismal task of determining whether the end users of these improvements truly value them. My research focuses on the intersection between the end user of electricity and adoption of community microgrids in the four corners. See, community microgrids offer the ratepayer a few notable benefits. They can increase the reliability and resilience of their local grid, allow better access to distributed energy resources such as rooftop solar, and provide limited power during a grid stress event. Determining what a ratepayer is willing to pay for these microgrid services is foundational for current and future grid modernization efforts. Microgrids come with a slew of barriers to entry. There are environmental components that may restrict adoption, such as a not in my backyard attitude, or a lack of support for investments that don't directly service for certain ratepayers. See, infrastructure investments in the four corners, they're often paid for by a means of cost recovery. For example, if an electric provider wants to bring a microgrid online, I will likely have to pay my fair share through a slight rate increase. So it is imperative that society and electric utilities fully understand my support and willingness to pay for these installations before ground is broke. I recently surveyed approximately 5,000 electric rate payers across the four corners and to determine that between 40 and 45% of respondents would be willing to increase their electric bill in exchange for a community microgrid installation depending on the level of direct tie-in that they would receive. Furthermore, I found that the median amount of a rate payer across the four corners would be willing to pay is an additional $14 to $25, um, again, depending on the level of benefits. Additionally, I find various ideological, political, and socioeconomic characteristics do impact the likelihood that a rate payer would be willing to pay or support the microgrid installation. To summarize, my research is focuses on determining the full scope of both market and non-market values associated with community microgrid services. This information is novel in its approach, but it provides a framework for electric utilities, public regulatory commissions, and other stakeholders to fully account for the economic value of community microgrids. Eight seconds to spare, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Jesse, well done. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much, you. Jesse. That was wonderful. Next up, we have Anhao Zhang. And Anhao, uh, we've got, if you're ready, go three, two, one. December 2015, the first non-successful cyber attack on a power grid took place in Ukraine. 230,000 residents were without electricity. The Ukraine power grid attack targets the traditional power grid system. So could such attacks be launched on the smart grid? Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Since more devices are connected to the 
internet to support remote controls and two-way communication. The smart grid actually provides a larger attack surface for the attackers. In order to prevent a cyber attack on the power grid, there are many technologies and the best practice should be adopted. In my research work, our design contributes to the foundation, the cornerstone of smart grid security, which is the device authentication. I believe authentication is not a stranger for everyone in this room. We perform basic password authentication on a daily basis when we unlock our phone, log into our workstation. The purpose of authentication is to validate user or device. However, when it comes to the device authentication, we cannot enter password for each of the device. We want the process to be automated so that when the device is plugged into the outlet, it will do whatever it's supposed to do without any user efforts. We also want the authentication process, which contains different cryptographic operation to consume as little computation resource as possible so that the authentication method can be used on the resource constrained device, such as IoT device, which are really powered by batteries. So therefore there are two big questions how to authenticate the device and how to make the authentication process more efficient. Our solution is to improve the authentication message flow designs to reduce the amount of traffic while maintaining a high level of security. As a result, our authentication process design can save nearly 50% of energy costs compared to zero existing designs. So the smart grid connects tens of millions of devices to the cyber networks. Uh, therefore, the cybersecurity is essential to guard our next generation power grid. Ooh, twenty-six seconds to spare. Very nice. Thank you, and how? Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Ali Garashi. And Ali. I, um, I guess most of you remember the massive power outage in Texas this year. This, this massive power blackout shows us we need to improve the reliability and resiliency of our power system. One way to address this issue is to design the electrical grid by connecting multiple microgrid systems. In this architecture, if there is a, if there is a fault happened on the distribution feeder, the microgrids can continue to work independently and support their local loads. In addition, if there is a fault happen inside each of the microgrids, uh, uh, the faulty microgrid can be isolated and the, uh, and the rest of the system can continue to work. We can use uh, this idea to improve the, the modularity and reliability of a single microgrid. To this end, we can design a microgrid by interconnecting multiple smaller scale microgrids, which are called nanogrids. Um, so in the similarly in this architecture, if there is a fault happened inside, inside the microgrid, for example, a fault on the microgrid common DC bus, the nanogrids can continue to work uh, independently and support their local loads. In addition, if there is a fault happened inside the nanogrids, the nanogrids can be, uh, the, the faulty nanogrid can be isolated without affecting the performance of the rest of the system. So it gives us a high level modularity and reliability and resiliency. But the problem is that the conventional control and management techniques that are widely used in microgrid applications are not suitable for this architecture. In our recent research, we have addressed this issue by proposing an adaptive control and management techniques. In this approach, we consider each nanogrid as an intelligent reactive agent get, that can change its dynamical behavior with respect to the system condition. It can also communicate with other neighboring nanogrids to effectively share power. In addition, we have designed an adaptive model predictive control strategy to improve the voltage quality inside the, inside the nanogrids. Also, the proposed uh, model predictive control strategy it improves the lifespan of the battery energy storage system inside, this, inside the multiple nanogrid system. So our proposed approach uh, has improved the efficiency 
and the voltage quality of the system. I should mention that uh, the results of this research has been uh, submitted in International Journal of Electric Power and Energy System, and it is still under the review. Thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful. Great job, Ali. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Up next, we have Don Melita. All right, Don, and three, two, one. Um, I don't have to tell anyone here that we're feeling the effects of climate change and we've found ourselves in a climate crisis. This year, we've seen historically catastrophic floods in Germany. There were over 200 major wildfires in the US. Tennessee experienced flash flooding. Well, for the first time, the Colorado River was declared short, triggering mandatory water consumption cuts for New Mexico. So it's obvious this climate change is rapidly creating a world we can't survive in. And unfortunately, the climate crisis is actually made worse by the fossil fuels used to power our electric grid. So the generators that power the electric grid in New Mexico are traditionally powered by coal-fired and natural gas-fired plants. But by using energy from renewable resources, we can minimize the use of the traditional generators and minimize the pollution they cause. So my research is focused on renewable resources generating energy at the distribution level of the power system. At New Mexico Tech, we have three arrays of solar cells like the one you see on the slide, and they each collect between 33,000 and 69,000 kilowatt hours a month, which at 13 cents a kilowatt hour means they're producing 13,000 to $27,000 of renewable energy every month. And this array of solar cells is just one example of an inverter-based generator. Unlike traditional rotational generation, which produces alternating current, inverter-based generators produce a direct current. And in order to add the DC to the AC distribution network, the DC produced by the solar cells needs to be converted to AC using an inverter. The modern inverters have interesting control capabilities that have let us come up with sophisticated power injection schemes. And it opened up the question, what's the best way to use the energy from these inverter-based generators? The first thing that comes to mind is we can use this energy directly as our power source, immediately completely injected into the grid and therefore reduce the demand on traditional fossil fuel generators. We do this now, it's an excellent start, but the unfortunate reality is that a variety of power system limitations lead to significant power losses when we inject power this way. So even though it's a good start, we can do better and we can be more efficient. Inverter-based generators can control the rate of power injection to react to real-time power demands of the distribution system. So my hypothesis of my research is that this will give us an ability to optimize efficiency of the power system and minimize power losses by increasing the power factor, balancing distribution phases, and providing energy during peak demand times. We can also perform better voltage regulation. In order to understand the best way to incorporate the sustainable energy into a distribution feeder microgrid, I created a three-phase model of an underground distribution network based on the campus of New Mexico Tech. This model is used in conjunction with real power consumption data collected from New Mexico Tech's buildings and power generation data connected from our solar cells. The next phase in my project is using the model to test my hypothesis and find optimal inverter-based generation power injection strategies, which will ultimately make our distribution network more efficient and reduce traditional power generation and resulting pollution. Thank you. I am, and just right under the skin of her teeth, she's in. Thank you, Don. That was fantastic as well. That was, that was really great. Wonderful. Next up, we have Eric Dreyer. Okay, Eric, and your time starts in three, two, one. Hi, my name is Eric Dreyer, and I'm a PhD student in computer science at New Mexico State University, and I'm part of Research Group 3, which explores using statistical and machine learning methods for decision, su decision support and smart grid technology. My research for the New Mexico smart grid revolves around time series analysis. Specifically, I've researched automatic change detection, which looks for transitions from one state of time series into another state. For example, we might want to analyze time series data about power usage to try and spot power outages and abnormal behavior in a community. Traditionally, this change detection is done with change point algorithms, which try to detect change as a single point. However, I found this assumption to be faulty in my research. In many scenarios, these changes or transitions can span multiple points in the time series. 
And in this example I have here, I have a time series that experiences an abrupt change in between the red dotted lines. When using a traditional change point detection algorithm, I often get multiple detections or no detections on an example like this, when really there is only one transition we're looking for. With my research, I've created a segment-based mechanism that adapts to these change point detection algorithms for these kinds of scenarios so that we can create more reliable and better detections of change in the time series. Instead of looking for change as a single point, I look for change as a relatively short segment of the time series. I recently wrote and published a paper on this research in the Conference of Information and Knowledge Management. So this research is important for New Mexico's Smart Grid project because part of the decision support research group is to automate detection of abrupt changes in the New Mexico Smart Grid. These changes could signify a critical failure or some abnormal behavior in some part of the system. And with so many sensors, we want to be able to automatically detect any sort of abrupt change from any sensor. Our research group is actively working to create better algorithms for detecting change to support smart grid decision making. Thank you for listening. Wonderful job. Wow. And with 30 minutes to spare, and you didn't even talk fast. That was wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Up next, we have Rudy Montoya. All right, Rudy, you are ready to go in three, two, one. Hello, my name is Rudy Montoya, and I am a graduate student at the University of New Mexico in the mechanical engineering department. And I'm here to speak about the research I've been conducting along with my team on DC microgrid fault detection using multi-resolution analysis of traveling waves. <laughs> I said a mouthful there. Um, and on the uh, diagram there, that's just uh, a two scale model of the smart microgrid over at Mesa del Sol, just for your uh, reference there. And so um, basically, uh, fault detection is going to be vital to the reliability of any electrical power system and utilizing the traveling waves that propagate in an electrical line when a fault is encountered provides detection in the microsecond time frame. Now, this methodology used is uh, kind of a multi-step process. Um, the approach first starts by taking fault current measurements uh, from running simulations in PSCAD software. Uh, the next step would be uh, conducting a multi-resolution analysis to calculate the wavelet coefficients for different frequency ranges. And so the wavelet coefficients are then transformed um, via what's called the Parseval theorem to get uh, the Parseval energies from these. And so the final step would be to uh, use these Parseval energy values um, and then also the fault location associated with those Parseval energies on the electrical line. And that's going to be the input and the output to train a machine learning algorithm and uh, what we were using is the Gaussian process for machine learning. Um, and there's other types of machine learning processes you can use as well. Um, now, depending on the microgrid uh, topology, the error in determining the fault location we found to be about two to 5%, which is pretty good. Um, now, a simple linear topology, as well as a more complex mesh topology have been studied and they both provide promising results. Um, in addition to that, different uh, machine learning algorithms were tested against the Gaussian process just to make sure that we we're using the most optimal method. And so the machine learning methodologies of uh, support vector regression, decision tree, artificial uh, neural networks, um, and the Gaussian process uh, did provide the most accuracy in determining the fault location, which is phenomenal. Um, so. Uh, the area of research in fast tripping electric schemes is very important uh, to microgrid systems uh, to ensure the reliability of these systems um, as they become more prevalent. Um, in addition to this, fast tripping protection schemes will prolong the life of expensive electrical switching equipment that are susceptible to damage from high fault currents. And uh, lastly, accurately determining the fault locations along the electrical line will save time and resources when repairs are to be made to the system there. So um, that's my presentation for today. And thank you everybody for your time. Woo 
Ooh, great job, Rudy. Wonderful. Well done. Wonderful. And we have last but certainly not least, Nitin Bandari. All right, Nitin, and you start in three, two, one. Hey, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm a CS major, uh, currently working as a software engineer, and I would like to talk about uh, the role of NSF in shaping my career. Uh, so as a college student, uh, you have set of uh, coursework uh, you need to follow. And yes, the curriculum might suit uh, better for a larger audience, but uh, overall, for overall development, there should be out-of-box experiences required which uh, not many people uh, get in, uh, as a student life. And I was lucky enough to receive such experience through NSF EPSCOR project, uh, which was to create a sustainable power grid. Um, I got the opportunity of a graduate researcher through my professor because of my interest. Uh, I became a part of cyber infrastructure group, uh, keen to provide uh, data storage support uh, to other research uh, groups where I had to uh, create web applications as my task. Uh, with a productive and encouraging environment, I got to learn a lot about a technology which I uh, which was guided through uh, and researched myself for uh, like producing effective project where I learned about like web development, uh, services, containerizations, etc. So while in the project, after gaining some experience, I found out uh, that the inherited technology uh, could not sustain for long. Therefore, I like, took the ownership of the project and uh, I re redefined the code base to a newer and robust uh, framework, which uh, can last longer and also could be contributed by others. Uh, this process gave me an immense confidence and uh, knowledge to uh, go forward in my career where I'm now. Uh, apart from the uh, technical contribution, I also got to work in uh, NM Workforce Development uh, Program where I uh, got certified as a, a software carpentry instructor. So in that process, I taught uh, and like helped basics of uh, computer science to non-computer science background students and people in the workshop and STEM app program. It was such a great experience where I empathized and shared my knowledge, especially in the areas where, uh, which was difficult for me while I was learning. So this was such a great opportunity to give my learnings back to the community. Uh, I would like to thank my professor and NSF for uh, providing such a great opportunity to grow and nurture my knowledge. Uh, more than knowledge acquired, I must say, I would take back the meaningful and long lasting connections with uh, some of the wonderful people I met. Uh, thank you, everyone. Ooh, well done, Nitin. 21 minutes or seconds to spare. Great job, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, sharing your, your flash talks and your three minute theses today um, in recognition of your wonderful contributions to the New Mexico Smart Grid and our, our overall project. We would like to award all of you uh, our New Mexico Smart Grid Exceptional Student Award. So uh, again, thank you so much for sharing your research um, and taking the time out to do your talk today. We really appreciate it. Oh. All right. For the next part of our program, I would like to introduce Anton Somali, President-Elect of the New Mexico Academy of Science, Patrick Burton from the American Chemical Society, and Jane Abel from the New Mexico Academy of Science. Thank you, Sarah, Brittany, and Isis. Thank you, EBSCOR. Thank you, everybody, for attending this afternoon session. <clears throat> Again, I'm Anton Somali, the President-Elect of the New Mexico Academy of Science or the Academy. Next slide, please. So everything that I will mention here, you can find more details at nmas.org. So please visit that site and you'll see a lot more information than I can present briefly now. Next slide. The Academy is an advocate and resource for science and science education. And you will see that in our symposium. We are uh, a co-sponsor of this annual research symposium. We are open to any person interested in science or science education. We have programs that I will talk about briefly. Next slide. Our goal is to foster scientific research and cooperation 
increase public awareness of science and promote science education, as you will see shortly. Next slide. There are a lot of interesting reasons to join us, but mainly to support science and science educator. Next slide. So the first program I would like to highlight is uh, the annual symposium. Next slide. So you have seen this this week. And again, we are a co-sponsor with EPSCOR. Thanks again, EPSCOR. Uh, and you know the participants are people like you, science professionals, professors, grad students, secondary students, i.e. high school students. And some of them are uh, members of our academy. Next slide. The Junior Academy of Science uh, is collaborating with the New Mexico uh, Journal, of, Journal of Science, but uh, the Junior Academy of Science emphasizes the paper competition instead of publication. Uh, they're welcome to publish if they win, of course. But <clears throat> these are for students grade six to 12, uh, this is for training students to communicate their work in science to others, encourages organized thinking and original research, and we collaborate with uh, regional and state science and engineering fairs. So we collaborate with pretty much all uh, research uh, uh, science fairs all around the state. Next slide. Then, as I mentioned before, there is a journal of science that publishes uh, the winners or a few winners uh, from the paper competition competitors. But this is more open mainly for uh, professionals, uh, professional researchers like professors and grad students published uh, only once a year, but we accept papers throughout the year. So consider publishing your original, uh, submitting your original research to the editor-in-chief, Vlad Sebastianov. His email address is here. It's also uh, on our NMAS uh, website. Next slide. Now that paper, I mean, the journal is peer reviewed and we prioritize issues that are important, especially to our state like water, climate change, uh, solar energy, and the environment. Uh, these are examples of covers from years past when uh, we were actually sending paper copies to all the academy members. Now uh, we are all electronic, our publications are online, open to everybody. But again, please consider submitting your original draft uh, manuscript to be peer reviewed and hopefully published in the journal. Next slide. Uh, the, the next program I would like to highlight is the National Youth Science Camp. Uh, we give a, a scholarship for two graduating New Mexico high school seniors. Uh, it pays for all expenses, uh, a trip, uh, to a camp in West Virginia. It's a nat national meeting of state winners. Uh, every state has, well, our state at least, uh, sends two candidates and two alternates uh, in case one of the candidates suddenly becomes uh, unavailable. Uh, so uh, please uh, spread the word about this program, uh, register your sibling or uh, your uh, outstanding student from the classroom to compete to win, uh, win these two prestigious uh, all expense paid trip to the national meeting. Next slide. And last but not least, especially for today, it's probably the most important and visible program that the Academy conducts 
It's the Outstanding Science Teacher Awards program. And this is for all New Mexico science teachers. Again, spread the word uh, about this program. Nominate your favorite uh, science teacher. Uh, this year, we got almost a dozen nominations. So it's the process. It's pretty, pretty competitive. Uh, the two outstanding teachers that will be awarded uh, honor today, you see why they win this competition. Uh, it's, it's a pretty prestigious award that I think should be advertised more. Uh, again, uh, nominate your candidate. And if you have any question, email Jane O'Bell, whom you will see in a few minutes. Next slide. Our dues are really low, uh, unless you want to be a life member. Uh, it's only $400. But otherwise, yearly membership is fifteen or twenty-five dollars. Next slide. I think this will be mine. Last slide. Again, everything I mentioned here, you can find more details on our website nmas.org, and feel free to email us or ask questions even uh, after these sessions. Enjoy the rest of this symposium. Thank you again for attending. Uh, hope to see you throughout the year. Uh, thank you, EPSCOR. Thank you, Sarah. Wonderful. And Patrick, would you like to come on and um, say a few words about the American Chemical Society and your contributions to this award? Uh, thank you. So the American Chemical Society is a uh, national um, uh, professional organization of chemists and chemical engineers. The uh, Central New Mexico Central Chapter of the society uh, covers uh, from um, Socorro to uh, uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico. So we incorporate uh, uh, the central region and um, uh, universities, including uh, New Mexico Tech, uh, University of New Mexico, and uh, New Mexico Highlands University. Uh, we're uh, very pleased to uh, support and encourage um, STEM education uh, in several different ways. Uh, one of our routine um, activities is uh, sponsoring science fair awards uh, throughout our uh, region. And we're very uh, uh, pleased to also sponsor $250 uh, awards to the um, uh, teacher awards this year. Thank you. Wonderful. And now we'd like to introduce Ms. Jane about who's going to tell us more about these awards. Thank you. And I think it's really pretty amazing. The New Mexico Academy of Science has been in existence for over 100 years, since before New Mexico actually was a state. The Outstanding Science Teacher Award has been presented since 1968. And we honor New Mexico's science and math educators who provide opportunities for their state students to succeed in science. Nominations are open to all pre-K through 12 teachers and all informal science educators throughout New Mexico. The award consists of a plaque and a monetary award from the Academy. And the American Chemical Society joins with the Academy in this award and also presents a monetary award. This year, as chair of the Outstanding New Mexico Science Teacher Awards, it's my privilege to announce our two amazing awardees in alphabetical order. Megan Strain from Las Cruces and Carrie Thatcher from Carlsbad. So let me start by talking about Megan Strain. She's a fifth grade science teacher at Desert Hills Elementary in the Las Cruces Public Schools. And yes, I said, elementary school science teacher. She's taught for nine years and for the past two years, she's been the departmentalized 
fifth grade science teacher teaching all fifth grade students an hour of dedicated science each day. This is pretty remarkable for elementary school. She's able to teach science all day in her classroom and dive deeply into science, more deeply than it's common for elementary school. In the words of her nominator, she generally cares for and supports her students and their families and is passionate about the success of her students. She understands how vital science education is and attends to equity by engaging all students in science learning. She also involves her larger school community by continuing to advocate for time spent in science teaching and learning. Her students actually enjoy having science every day. Many say this is their favorite class. They collaborate through hands-on science and engineering experiences. They read, write, speak, and listen about science concepts. They give presentations to their peers and engage in the foundations of scientific argument. Ms. Drain has also served on her district elementary science leadership committee, which has been a critical component in promoting science education in Las Cruces public schools by creating district science instructional guides for teachers and building content during remote instruction. So, Ms. Strain, it is my great honor to present to you with this plaque from the New Mexico Academy of Science. And the plaque and a check will be mailed to you from the Academy. Congratulations. And I'd like to ask Patrick Burton to make the presentation on behalf of our partner in this word, ACS. Well, thank you. That's a, a very exciting uh, description of the uh, work that you do. I thought it was uh, particularly wonderful that um, uh, elementary students are um, uh, conducting um, um, uh, presentations uh, at that uh, very early age. That's uh, incredible. So uh, we're, uh, very glad to support your uh, um, uh, support and encourage your work and uh, are uh, pleased to award you a $250 uh, award uh, in conjunction with the uh, New Mexico Academy of Science. Thank you very much. Ms. Strain, would you like to say something? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, I want to thank the New Mexico Academy of Science for selecting me to be the 2021 um, Science Teacher of the Year. It is a privilege to represent Desert Hills Elementary School, as well as the Las Cruces Public Schools District. It's an honor to have been nominated by Michelle Estrada, who has been an exemplary mentor and a great supporter throughout my time as a science teacher. I am proud to say that my love and excitement for science is being instilled in our students, allowing them opportunities to have those experiences they otherwise wouldn't have in an elementary school setting. Three years ago, I was given the amazing opportunity to work on our fifth grade team as a science teacher. Every day, our students get an hour dedicated to each subject. Because of this, our students can dive deeper into the content and gain a more robust understanding of science concepts. I get to expand and emphasize by giving students time to work collaboratively with one another through meaningful hands-on activities, partner work, and class discussions. Every day I get to see my students excited and engaged in learning something new. Being able to impact students' lives is why I love teaching science. I get to see my students looking ahead and questioning things, which leads to a new lesson that they are interested in learning about. My hope is that students move forward in their education with an intense interest in and passion for science. Lastly, I wanna thank my incredible family for all the love and support that they have shown me throughout the years. Their encouragement pushes me to be the very best teacher, 
mom and wife that I can be. Again, I am honored and humbled to be one of the 2021 Science Teachers of the Year. Thank you again. Great, great congratulations. Our second awardee is Carrie Thatcher. And Ms. Thatcher is a sixth, sorry, <clears throat> sixth to 12th grade science teacher at Jefferson Montessori School, Jefferson Montessori Academy, a charter school authorized by Carlsbad Municipal Schools. She has taught for 10 plus years and is also the science fair mentor and special education coordinator for the school. She is revered at JMA as a science nerd and wows the younger students with her wacky Halloween experiments and Star Wars knowledge. Ms. Thatcher has taught integrated science, biology, physical science, horticulture, and chemistry. In the words of her nominator, Ms. Thatcher was the driving force in creating a science fair requirement in 2015 for middle school and secondary students that focused on student interest and was fueled by parent and staff volunteers. What began as a school science fair has become annual regional, state, and even international fair participation. In 2019, a weekly STEM club was created to allow experienced science fair students to mentor younger students with their research and projects. Ms. Thatcher believes that the science competitions are an excellent opportunity for students to learn how to handle themselves in interviews, respond to criticism appropriately, and be supportive of each other. She collaborates with other teachers to reinforce math concepts and ELA skills in student science presentations. Her dedicated mentorship of both middle and high school students has led to an extremely successful track record of awards and recognition, including competing and placing in the International Genius Olympiad in New York for five years. The most amazing testament to her ability to turn science into a passion among students is that past graduates return to talk about science or volunteer as a science fair judge for a new batch of what are known as Thatcher's science kids. Ms. Thatcher, it is my honor to present you with this plaque from the New Mexico Academy of Science. The plaque and a check for $500 for each of you will be mailed to you from the Academy. Congratulations. And now I'd like to ask Patrick Burton once again to make the presentation on behalf of ACS. Uh, thank you. That's uh, uh, wonderful to hear how you're uh, encouraging uh, the students to uh, uh, really enjoy science and uh, remain active and engaged and uh, come back uh, uh, further in their careers. So we're uh, very pleased to award you a $250 uh, award uh, in uh, conjunction with the uh, Academy of Science. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Thatcher, please. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, still muted. And I saw you unmute, so I'm not sure what's going on.
still muted. Let me try to mute and unmute. Um, how about now? China. Ms. Thatcher. Oh, no. Um, do you have a headphone plugged in by any chance? No. Hmm. What do our EPSCOR Zoom webinar experts think? Um, yeah, I'm maybe try relogging in, Carrie. Um, and we can just sing your praises until you get back in. Um, or, or talk about Star Wars facts that are incorrect, just to see how long it takes like to motivate you to get the sound <laughs> on. <laughs> I like that idea. If I, I knew any, I, I would do that. But I, I don't. I'm a big fan of using science fiction to teach science fact. So we will wait just a few more minutes. It would be a shame not to hear from Ms. Thatcher. Absolutely. Oh, and she has rejoined. Okay, says she's connecting to audio. Okay. Uh, still no. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. <laughs> I feel like a Verizon commercial. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, I am overwhelmed with gratitude to have been selected to receive the Outstanding Science Teacher Award. Thank you all so much for being here to share in this occasion. I'm so honored to have my work recognized in this way by the New Mexico Academy of Science. It means so much to me that the work that I am passionate about also resonates with others. This accomplishment is not something that I did alone, and there are many others who deserve to share in this award. I would like to thank Deanna Weston Helmer for always supporting my efforts, the staff, and especially the students at JMA. Um, without the kids, this would not have been possible. I would like to thank my family and friends for their encouragement, love, and support throughout my career. I would also like to thank Ryan Helmer and all of my students for the many adventures and accomplishments in science research competitions. Last but not least, thank you to the New Mexico Academy of Science for offering recognition to science teachers like me. I hope that this recognition of my work can serve as an inspiration to others in the field Remember, if my work can make a difference, so can yours. I will continue my efforts to in, in, inspire and instill a love for science in every student I come into contact with and look forward to helping many more students discover that science is in fact fun. For many years to come, I am humbled and appreciative. Thank you. That, that is terrific. Thank you. Ms. Strain, turn your video on one last time here. And let's all of us congratulate these two really amazing New Mexico science teachers. Congratulations. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Green and Ms. Thatcher. And by the way, uh, the New Mexico Journal of Science has published uh, Ryan Helmer's paper as one of the best student papers for this 2021 edition. Thank you. I mean, 2020. Congratulations again. Congratulations to both of you. And thank you. I think we're done. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick, Anton, and Jane. And again, congratulations to the awardees. Um, this is always one of my favorite parts of this presentation. 
All right, finally, we would like to announce and recognize this year's poster winner from this sessions of from this year's poster session. Um, when your name is announced, please turn on your camera and mic uh, to accept your award. And if you would like to say a few words, you are more than um, more than welcome to. First, we will announce the undergraduate awards. In third place, we have uh, Candy Marty, Anthony Franklin, and Dimitri Rodriguez for their poster, Machine Learning with Semi-Supervised Outlier Detection Algorithms for Detecting Cyber Attacks on Smart Grids. Candy, do you wanna? And yep, Candy is going to join us in just a second. Fabulous, fabulous. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, <laughs> um, I'm Candy Marty, and um, I worked with Dimitri and Anthony, uh, Dimitri Rodriguez and Anthony Franklin <clears throat> on the machine uh, learning project for um, the summer EPSCOR uh, cohort. Uh, being part of the EPSCOR STEM map Summer cohort was a great experience. We worked, we enjoyed working together. Uh, we would like to thank the National Science Foundation, um, uh, Sarah, Selena, Ruben Key, Craig Rasband, Jun Zhang, and Raul Langoria for their initial research and assistance. And a special thanks to our team mentor, George Nail, and everybody in the cohort this summer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Candy, and um, other authors for that. And congratulations. In second place in our undergraduate category uh, from Navajo Technical University, we have Justin Platero and Michael Nellwood, Caitlin Wilson, Jasmine Charlie, Michaela Begay, and Samantha Francis with their poster titled, Design and Fabrication of Flexible Paper-Based Electrochemical Sensors to Detect Heavy Metals in Groundwater. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Justin Platero. Um, I'm a undergrad at Navajo Technical University. I'm in the biology program there. And I'd just like to thank you all for this uh, award. I'm very honored to receive this. And I'd also like to thank all my team members for working hard towards this um, and my PI. And I'd also like to thank my PI for introducing me to electrochemistry. And I'd like to thank my collaborators from Harvard and um, I'm just very humbled to receive this award. Thank you. Congratulations. In first place in our undergraduate category from Navajo Technical University, we have Michael Nedwood, Nellwood and Justin Platero with their poster titled, Fabrication of Low-Cost Paper-Based Electrodes. Do you like to say a few words, Michael? Um, I think Michael might be experiencing, experiencing some technical difficulties. Okay. Well, we'll keep trucking along and uh, we will accept this award on his behalf and we will circle back if we can get him back online. Oh, I think we're coming back. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Um, thank you for the award. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, my personal friend, for allowing me to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Congratulations to the first place poster. All right. Next, we're going to go on to our graduate awards. In third place um, is Jason Banigas with his poster titled GIS Based Methods for Electric Charging, Electric Vehicle Charging Site Station Selection. How are you doing? Congratulations. Oh, thanks so much. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, say thank you to uh, my advisor on this uh, uh, project is Dr. Jamal Mamkesri. Uh, he, he was a, a great mentor for this, um, and I'm really excited to take our research from the systematic review I did and expand it into uh, uh, the new stage of research, putting uh, putting um, what I what I reviewed into into action and into some uh, 
uh, to some some real economic and energy um, uh, research now that now that I have a, a review done in this area. So um, thank you, uh, Dr. Montgomery, and thank you, EPSCOR, for for having this uh, this uh, great symposium. Well, thanks so much, and again, congratulations on your third place poster. In second place in our graduate category, we have Jesse Kazmarski with his poster titled Public Support for Community Microgrids. Hey, how's it going? Um, again, my name is Jesse Kazmarski. I am with the UNM, UNM Department of Economics, and I also am on contract with the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. And I did a lot of research over the summer about uh, microgrids and do people want them and are they valuable? And I got to survey the four corners. So not just New Mexico, but a little bit beyond. Um, it was a lot of fun. I would like to thank Janie Shermack, um, who's the lead on this project and uh, really helped me develop this project together and build it and just run it and all that jazz. And I would also like to thank EPSCOR for giving me the opportunity and the platform to do this type of work. and. Uh, show me that this is something I'm interested in and I'm gonna go all the way on it. So thank you. Wonderful, well, thank you so much. And again, congratulations on second place. In our, our first place winner in our graduate category is Risa Islam for their poster titled, User Controllable Privacy Management Mechanism in the Smart Grid System, Ontology-Based Ontology Approach. Uh, hello. So my name is Raisa Islam and I'm a graduate student at NM Tech. Um, uh, I'm really humbled to receive this award. I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Dongwan Shin and my lab mates who helped me to uh, finish this, this project and uh, especially EPSCOR to giving me such opportunities. Thank you. Congratulations, and you're very welcome. Uh, the last award of our session is People's Choice, where attendees were able to vote on their favorite poster. This year's winner is Risa Islam with her poster titled User Controllable Privacy Management Mechanism in the Smart Grid System, Ontology-Based Approach. Would you like to say a few words? If not, we can all, yep, fabulous. Yeah, uh, I just, yeah, I got two hours. So yeah, that's the win for me. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. And Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. All right. A, a huge congratulations to all of our winners for this year's session. Um, without you, uh, we could not do a post session. So thank you so much. Um, also, a huge thank you to this year's sponsors, the New Mexico Academy of Science, New Mexico EPSCOR, American Chemical Society, New Mexico Space Grants, and the New Mexico Center for Water and the Environment. Um, it also would not have been possible without our speakers and our presenters this week, Dr. Larry Crumpler, Dr. Anjali Moshandani, Paulo Omeg, and the entire Space Jam panel, our 19 poster judges who graciously lent their time, um, and all of our attendees. Uh, finally, events like this cannot happen without an amazing team behind me. So thank you to Isis, Brittany, Dustin, and Selena, and all the EPSCOR team for making this event possible. Uh, that concludes our portion of this session. Uh, everything will be posted on our website in due time. Uh, so thank you all for attending and have a wonderful, wonderful Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. You're so welcome, Anton.